It's a, a real honor for me to, to chair this, uh, this panel discussion because there are really extremely experienced surgeons here and we are running through the topic total hip arthroplasty in the young patient. Each of these surgeons here is doing several hundred procedures per year and they have a great experience and it's a real honor for me. To start this uh, session, I would like to get an, uh, a feeling of the experience in total hip replacement in the audience. Who of you is performing uh, up to 50 uh, total hips per year, zero to 50? Who is performing 50 to 100? And who is performing more than 100 per year? So this is the majority. Um, we will have a very interesting uh, discussion, I think. Uh, and I start uh, before we start with the first case. It's always a concern about what is the young patient. Um, it's a big debate and we have to make a definition starting when we look at the panel members, uh, assuming they come to you and having surgery. Would you consider the panel members as young patients? Yes. Who says yes? Please. Who says yes? Who is the here young person? Thank you very much. I don't, uh, I don't, uh, is uh, George Gramatopoulos here? George is not here, okay. Klaus, may I do a remark on that? Rüdiger, please. It's important for everyone in the audience to know in their academic institution how an older patient or a young patient by definition is to be presented by residents. So a young patient is age of the boss and younger. <laughs> okay. And never, never get another okay. definition. So we talk about young patients today, or at least middle-aged patients, we will see. Let's start with the first case. This is a 18-year-old female, um, young lady, high school student, very intelligent, a tiny lady, body mass index of 24. She sustained a femoral neck fracture in 2005 has severe day and night pain and conservative therapy is not any more possible. This is the case here. I make the case a little bit larger so you see that. Who in the audience, based on yesterday's lecture, would consider joint preserving surgery? Is there anyone who would consider joint preserving? One, two, three. Who would do joint replacement? Okay, the majority. Let's ask the panel, who of you would consider joint preserving surgery in this patient? Th severe day and night pain? No one. All of you would recommend joint replacement. Let's go further. This is the next question. What is the choice of uh, selection? Uh, cementless stem, cemented stem, cementless cup and cemented cup. Who in the audience would go for a cementless device? Who would do a cemented device? Let's ask the audience. Anyone in favor of a cemented or partially cemented device? No one, all of them cementless. Hubert, let's start here with the mother. Sorry, for the, for the sake of discussion, if you don't mind. I, 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 would, I might consider using a cemented stem, um, and I don't think that's wrong. If, if you are very skilled in using cemented stems, I think you should do that. Uh, considering the not very good real long-term uh, results of the Swedish registry beyond 20 years of cemented stems, you would nevertheless use a cemented, uh, consider a cemented stem. So, uh, I still would consider a cemented stem. I think, I think it's important for us to know what registries do. What, what we as a registry do is providing you the outcome for the average surgeon. If the average surgeon is using the uncemented stems in the majority of the cases, and they are used to use the uncemented cases for the young patients, and they use that in the old patients as well, then obviously the uncemented stems will do better for you. Okay. But if, if, the, young, if the young patients uh, are operated with a, with a cemented stem by somebody who's doing 250 cases cemented since 25 years ago, I think we, most of us will be agreeing that that outcome is going to be much better than the same surgeon doing an uncemented stem fixation. If we continue now on that discussion and I uh, uh, ask for your understanding that we stop it here, we would sit here for an hour discussing cemented versus cementless. So let's take with us the majority would do a cementless, but I see your arguments. Hubert, if we do a cementless, uh, would you go for a, any type of short stem implant uh, or would you prefer a standard stem? 
Um, in this case, I would, I would consider a short stem because uh, you have good bone and in, nevertheless you have a necrosis, so you would have be, to be a little bit more careful in the post-operative uh, uh, weight bearing, but otherwise uh, short stem is, an issue, uh, is, a, is possible, but you could also use a CLS or something co uh, comparable. Justin, is this a case for hip resurfacing? And if yes, which type of material would you propose? Well, um, the first thing is, at age 18, this is the most valuable hip that we're going to discuss. This woman may live for 100 years. And so it's worth putting a lot of um, effort and time into the planning here. So the question for me is, what's the status of that femoral head? And this might, I definitely would do some axial imaging to show that sclerotic. Um, can you just zoom in again? You did a nice zoom in picture. Um, maybe on before, yeah, there. So is that sclerotic bone, what's the blood supply like up there? I definitely would consider it because she's so young. And, and, and as um, Hubert says, her, her um, neck is, is all alive. Um, and I, so if, that is, if that's not a very big dead area, and that's a question, we would certainly plan a, um, a ceramic resurfacing. I mean, she'd be eligible for a ceramic resurfacing um, if we could plan it and we would prepare the bone and if it looked viable, um, I think that's a conservative option in a, in a very young person. But I, you spoke about ceramic resurfacing. Would you agree that at the moment we should not recommend metal on metal resurfacing in that young lady? So in England, we don't have any access to metal on metal resurfacing in young women. However, the data in, um, I think Paul could probably comment on this, I think the data um, for women, female resurfacing, using devices that were not designed, that were not sexist. There are some devices that were designed by men for men. And I think the Conserve Plus, um, I think it's, it, it will be worth considering. She's 18 years old. Paul, Paul, I don't want to extend the discussion. Just the question, would you do metal on metal in an 18-year-old girl like that? It's okay. Yeah, yeah no. Um, any, un any other who would support the option of Justin? Very briefly, jo A Question for Justin. Do you support something which is not experimental, but very close to experimental, such as a ceramic resurfacing in an 18-year-old patient? Well, the, the alternative is cutting out large bits of her body and putting stiff bits of metal into her femur. The alternative is a well-proven implant with long-term results such as the CLS. Also this discussion, we could now continue for one hour. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I have to stop it. I'm really sorry. We are going for the majorities here. I, this is not always wise, but in this discussion today we have to go for majorities. The majority would in this lady use a cementless um, either standard or short stem implant. Now the question is, if we do that, if you do a cementless stem, what is the bearing choice? Just a very short comment. Jay, may you start? You said always 28 millimeter on um, as thick as possible poly. Is this also the, your choice in this lady? Yes. Any other, any other advice from the podium? 32 ceramic on ceramic. 32 ceramic on ceramic. As big as possible ceramic, delta ceramic on ceramic. As big as possible. Delta ceramic, Hubert? Um, ceramic head and uh, cross-linked polyethylene, 32. Mazar? I second that. The other Mazar? As large as possible. As large as possible ceramic head with poly. Rüdiger? Well, I would discuss this with a patient, and in our experience, we use a lot ceramic on ceramic, but we have patients who really go over the whole um, options they have later on and, and their caution and their fear and their expectation. And some of these, uh, they, they choose a highly crosslink on ceramic and it might be one of the good options. And head size, I would, using poly, I would not go uh, above 32. So we see we can do everything. Uh, in the audience, what is your feeling? Who would use in this lady highly crosslinked? I think there's no doubt that we only use highly uh, ultra high molecular highly crosslinked polyethylene who would use highly crosslinked poly polyethylene on ceramic 
Who would use ceramic on ceramic? Half and half. Who would use something different? Okay, half and half. This is what we did. We did a standard stem, a delta ceramic head on a, uh, it was a 32 millimeter head on a conventional uh, press fit cup with um, polyethylene. But we see every other situation is possible. When we look at the literature in the moment, this is the bearing choice in the US just recently published by Bedar. You see in the US, ceramic on ceramic is pretty low. This is the yellow line here. Metal on metal is going down and disappearing from the market. Ceramic on polyethylene, the gray line here is increasing a lot in the US and metal on polyethylene is going down. So in the US at least, obviously, most surgeons do what Jay is, uh, is uh, recommending, ceramic on polyethylene. In Australia, the ceramic is gray, ceramic on ceramic increased till 2011, now it's decreasing interestingly. Ceramic and polyethylene, the blue line is increasing and uh, metal on metal is disappearing also. So there's at the moment obviously met, uh, no more metal on metal. Ceramic on polyethylene or ceramic on ceramic uh, choices you can also take in young patients. Can I just, uh, just make a Jay? comment about that U.S. graph, please, Klaus? Part of the reason why you don't see a lot of ceramic on ceramic in U.S. is we don't have delta on delta okay. available with the exception of one company that limits the use of it to one stem type. Okay. That uh, explains this uh, nicely, I think. Um, not going into the ceramic issue, but we should be aware that the squeaker rate is in between 1 and 24% of patients due to a, a review here. Um, and uh, Jay already raised the issue that even with uh, delta ceramics, you have an issue of uh, liner breakage. It's not a lot, but uh, probably two out of 1,000 patients uh, sustain these liner fractures due to uh, different factors, just to bear that in mind. But now we come back to the real, the real important question. The patient and his parents are sitting in front of you and the questions are always the same. How long will my artificial joint last? How often do I have to undergo revision surgery? What is your personal answer in this case? Just very briefly, no, no long story. What is the risk of revision and what do you tell the patients? Hubert. Just one more comment to the ceramic, ceramic. What oh, we never, no, no. no. One, one point that is never mentioned is that you need much more stiff cups. That's and right. in the long term, that That's may right. be a problem. Not yeah. so, so much the fracture of the ceramic, ceramic, but the stiff cups. Okay, this is a very important uh, information. You tell your patient, I take a very stiff cup. Um, how does this influence the revision rate? What is now your recommendation when the patient is sitting in front of you? How often will I be revised and how long will this hip last? I tell the patient that in the average it's still 15 to 20 years that you uh, could uh, okay. have a revision. Maza? Sorry, I would possibly say that the, it's impossible to know in your case exactly, but uh, according to the recent statistics, the risk of you having a new surgery within, within 15 years is about 20%. Justin? Um, uh, Excuse me, Mazar. Do the patients understand your risk of revision within 20 years is 20%? Do the patients understand that? I think they do, okay. especially if they are 18 or 19 years old. That, I don't that's do that a good point. That's a good old. point. We don't talk to the 75-year-old uh, lady. Yeah. Justin? With the 18-year-old, I would say... If it's micro? If, micro? If it, if micro? It's, if it's ceramic on ceramic, um, if there's a problem, it's, a, it's because I did something wrong, that the bearings, they can't wear out. The nice thing about hard on hard bearing is they can use it as much as they like. You know, the modern, they don't have to worry about wearing it out. If there's a problem, it'll either be they fell off a motorbike or I did the operation wrong. Any other comment on that, Jay, or? 100 years. 100 years, Luigi? Hundred years as well. I say, Hirsch, you will be revised at least twice in nice. your okay. life, and you have 80, 85 okay. percent to okay. have the same implant in 20 years. Wait a minute, though. Everybody keeps quoting those figures, right? If you you believe in the tribology data, highly crossing polyethylene is 0 0.1 millimeter per year. If you use a 28 millimeter header, you got in 12 millimeters of poly in there. That's 120 years, yeah. right? 
Yep. Now, I understand that there is fracture, dislocation, infection, periprosthetic fractures, and other stuff that can happen. But that revision data that everybody keeps throwing around, that revision data doesn't hold for bearing surface. That's a problem with the total hip replacement. But you're talking about a bearing surface with that patient. So okay. you tell them, as long yeah. as, as, as Justin said, as long as the initial complications are out, the lack, likelihood of this bearing surface lasting is 100 years. Yeah, we continue just, uh, this is uh, a recent publication from The Lancet in young people about 15, the chance of revision is, the lifetime chance of revision is 30%, and it's probably even much higher in the younger patient, but uh, it's uh, a difficult discussion as we know. We continue to the next case. This is a 17-year-old boy. He's uh, not as intelligent as his girlfriend, which we have seen before. He has some difficulties in school. He has a body mass index of 28, a very nice guy, very active. And his goal is to get a craftsmanship education. He doesn't want to study. He wants to do really hard work in his life. When you look at this hip, you exactly know what the history was several external attempts over three or four years to uh, rescue this hip, finally resulting in that situation. Extremely painful, stiff, a stiff and painful hip, no chance to uh, be good in school, no chance to get any education. The alternatives are joint preserving surgery, arthrodesis and total hip replacement. Let's start with the audience. Who would do in such a case uh, joint preserving surgery? One, two, who would do arthrodesis of this side? Who would do a total hip replacement? Okay, let's ask the audience. Is anyone in the panel here um, in favor of joint preserving surgery in this case? No one? Who of you would consider an arthrodesis? Rüdiger, please. Well, at least I would explain that there is an alternative to total hip replacement and that the arthrodesis is the alternative and he might consider this. But he also needs to know the pros and cons of it. And in our area, we, today we cannot sell an arthrodesis, but we would talk about it as an alternative. And I show you later in my presentation a young lady which as a child had an arthrodesis and we took it down when she came to adolescence. And she is happy to talk to other patients saying how, how hard it is to have an arthrodesis in the community because her walking, <coughs> I show you later, is nice, but sitting and all the activities young people have are so difficult. So I would discuss it, but I, I, today I probably will not sell it. Mazar, also discussion or? About yeah, arthrodesis. arthrodesis in a Muslim country is uh, completely out of question. Uh, so I, I would go with a total hip replacement. Okay, most of the uh, panel members would do a, uh, a it's, uh, it's, uh, would do a, a, a total hip replacement. I don't ask about the fixation because in this boy uh, we did this situation. It was a nice previous operation, and you see. Um, five years post-operatively, some reaction here, is absolutely pain-free, no problem at all. It's two or three millimeters of subsidence of this stem, maybe a little bit of virus, this reaction. I don't know what happens in the future, but um, this is uh, life as it is. He's absolutely satisfied, he's going to professional education, uh, happy with his life, uh, and we will see what happens. But I think this highlights the problem. Klaus, that, that, wh yeah. why did you choose a, a conical stem in this case? Because he had a mal torsion. Uh, we did not exactly know intraoperatively. Uh, we did a, a CT, and it's difficult to judge with this sh short neck the real uh, antiversion. We did uh, choose this implant because this gives a high range of uh, freedom uh, adjusting the the intraoperative torsion, but of course it could be possible to do another stem as well. But you know, this is the beauty of that stem, has one of the long, I know which stem this is, it's got one of the longest track records, and the beauty is, is even though this is a fully extens extended stem, it uh, provides uh, bone density across the entire, and in a young patient like this, I think that's best option, as opposed to using the modular stem, because if you have an issue with the yeah. torsion, yeah. Uh, so this stem is probably the best stem to yeah. use in the younger patients. Thank you for your support. 
we go to the next uh, case, uh, and now the warm-up is over, and we are going a little bit into more severe cases. Uh, let's start with a just uh, mild case uh, of, uh, referring to our yesterday's discussion. This is the 34-year-old man. He has a bilateral avascular necrosis of both hips. He was a former heavy smoker and alcohol uh, uh, addictor. He completely went off that. He is now not anymore smoking, no more alcohol. Uh, the hips are completely destroyed. He is uh, independent in his professional education and needs very quick surgery to go back again because he has a lot of pain. I bring the images a little bit uh, more close to you. The first question to the audience again, who would consider joint preserving surgery in this young man? Who would consider joint preserving? We had yesterday a beautiful discussion about the options and I learned a lot. Who would consider this? No one really? Okay. So anyone in the panel thinking about head preservation? No one? So all of you would do a total hip replacement. The next question is, would you do a staged total hip replacement starting on the right side and three weeks after doing the left side? Or would you do a simultaneous bilateral procedure? Any options on that? Jay, you mentioned the possibility of bilaterals in combination with the anterior approach. What would your preferred uh, procedure be? Yeah. Uh, simultaneous bilateral, as long as the patient is not sick. He is absolutely healthy. Yeah. Cardiopulmonary in an absolutely fit uh, situation, no smoking anymore, absolutely perfect. This will be perfect for simultaneous bilateral. Yeah. Who else would do this uh, simultaneously? Justin, Mazar, both Mazars. Hubert? Staged. Why staged Hubert? Uh, I think you, you control much better blood loss and everything, so you don't need any blood in those patients when you do it staged, and uh, that's for me one of the reasons uh, to do it staged. All the publications on, uh, on less invasive approaches, regardless anterior, anterior, whatever, they all tell us you don't have any bloodless uh, at all uh, at the end. So is this still an argument? Is this still an argument? This Luigi, paper no, I'm a little bit provocative to raise the discussion. No, 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 Luigi? I agree. I know this, this, this uh, approach in the papers, but they never report about what happens if they have one complication on one side. This is the main issue. But anyway, this can be a good candidate. I think that in a case of this, you have to speak with the patient, explaining what are the advantage of one stage and the advantage of two-stage okay. procedure. Okay. This is the main point, okay. and then you can do both. Yeah. Most of you obviously would do a bilateral simultaneous. What is your preferred approach if you would do a bilateral? Uh, Hubert, you, you do uh, unilateral. What is your approach at the moment for unilateral? Anterolateral. Anterolateral. Next, Mazar, bilateral simultaneous approach? Posterior piriformis sparing. Posterior, so the, you start on one side, rotate the patient around, and do it on the other side in the same surgery. Justin? Same, same procedure. Jay? Direct anterior. Direct anterior. Luigi? Same then, posterior. Posterior, rotating the yeah. patients in surgery. Rüdiger? Anterolateral. Both anterolateral. Mazar? Uh, posterior is my main choice, but I, uh, this is the only patient I would consider doing uh, direct anterior. Okay. We asked, or, or we answered the surgical approach. This is what we have done. We did a simultaneous bilateral, a little bit shortener stem with a uh, conventional cup. We did a bilateral anterior approach. This was at the time where I did the uh, anterior perfect result. This is the uh, femoral head during surgery. So I think the question about head preserving surgery is relative when you look at, uh, at both heads here. So, yeah, Mazar. Can I ask you a question? Of course. Uh, could, could you please describe why you choose to use a short stem in this case and a, and a standard stem in the previous case? Yeah, This is not the typical short stem. Uh, probably Hubert can comment on it more. It's, it's not uh, marketed as a short stem. It's a little bit shorter than the standard stems. It's a stem with head which has several options to reconstruct the offset nicely, which uh, you see here w w was, uh, was uh, okay. Um, it has a, a good uh, track record uh, up to eight years now, and uh, it seems to work well in young patients. Any other comment, Hubert? Just the length of this stem is given by uh, 
the fact that you want to have to bring it in in a, in a, in an arc and not bring it straight down that is the, that makes the the length of the stem and nothing else so okay. it's it was never intended to develop uh, uh, a short stem when we did develop this stem okay we continue with the next case and now we are raising the difficulty a little bit this is a 26 year old lady a very nice lady she has one child uh, she's German Turkish lives since uh, 15 years in Germany and the surgery on the right side was performed by German surgeons um, she is very cute she has uh, 158 centimeters of length her body mass index is 23 kilograms so a real cute lady a small cute lady um, she has a painful right hip more than the left hip um, we have made an injection into the joint and have made an injection here and it's clearly the joint which is hurting this is not a clinical problem and she has a shortening of two centimeters here so this is a situation which we often see now we must uh, uh, look into the history this was done by an, a surgeon uh, uh, in, in at the age of about I think uh, 15 or something like that or, or, or 13 uh, or uh, 10 excuse me by the age of 10 shortening osteotomy he created some type of uh, of uh, new joint here um, and the situation is of course not uh, satisfactory at the moment uh, let's start with the most experienced uh, dysplasia surgeons probably from Turkey a uh, mother uh, this lady definitely needs a total hip replacement we don't talk about something else here the questions are where to put the cup do we put the cup in this position here in the false acetabulum or do we aim at the primary acetabulum do we revise the psoid arthrosis here do we need a femoral shortening what are the post proposed implants but we go step by step only the first questions very brief comment cup position would you consider cup position here or would you go down it, it looks like this patient was operated by a, a, Tur a Turkish surgeon the first time and uh, the classic uh, modification uh, was performed when she was 10, uh, 10 years old. So she has a pretty strong uh, shelf there. Uh, actually, in uh, CDH cases, we always try to use the true acetabulum despite the size. But in this case, uh, I w this is probably the only one I would make in uh, ob uh, exception and use the pseudo acetabulum okay and uh, uh, the shortening would be dictated by the um, after trial uh, trying to reduce a trial in the uh, acetabulum we uh, reconstruct this is a beautiful thing about international meetings I always ask myself how the surgeon created the acetabulum here and not down. Now I learned that. What's the name of this procedure? Uh, it's actually known as the Chakrigil operation. Chakrigil. Yes, it was um, published in the um, Campbell Orthopedics okay. uh, textbook. So this was intended to get the joint here. Now, Luigi, brief comment, placing the cup here or going down into the primary acetabulum, which is not here anymore? I think that we cannot decide this without a CT scan. So you want a CT, you get the CT. I'm, I'm aware this is a CT here and not here, but I tell you the diameter of, oh, bone, oh, the, diameter of the bone here is 35 millimeters. Here, the diameter is 42 millimeters. So it's 35 millimeter, the AP diameter here, 32, uh, 35 uh, millimeters. The problem, I, I basically agree with uh, Mazar, but the problem is that this uh, new acetabulum is not just high, it's also all posterior. So if you put the cap there, you are in big troubles for with everything. You mean the, the you mean the retroversion? The, the, yes. the retroversion when we compare it to other side, the other side has a has a favorable uh, yeah. natural antiversion, and here we have a retroversion of about uh, forty degrees or something like yeah. that. Which and puts the, you are trouble. purely put in the posterior wing yeah. of of the pelvis. Yeah. Uh, well, so uh, I want to know, it's because it's not a major issue of dimension to go down. The problem for me here is the stability of this pseudoarthrosis and to be able to find at least some posterior wall there. That's what I would like to see a CT scan. Okay. Anyway, that's... Okay. Is there anyone in the podium who would consider 
not to take this acetabulum here, the secondary, and go deeper? Jay? I would. Of course, there would be an intraoperative decision. Yeah. I don't get a CAT scan in these because it just scares you before you go to the OR. <laughs> Doesn't help you much. So intraoperatively, I would start from that area. If I can get a 42 cup in that area, you can. At that diameter of 36 doesn't mean anything because you actually have to get there and then try to make that big enough to put it and then preserve the head and I would use the head as a graft up there. But if you can't, you've got to put it in the uh, pseudo acetabulum. Hubert? I would do the same. I would try to uh, use the head as an autograft and go down as, as far as possible, but deciding intraoperatively. And uh, what I would like to have in addition would be an MRI to see how the musculature is uh, really behaving, because you don't know with all the previous surgery if there is still musculature there or not. Yeah. My argument, my personal argument for a preoperative CT scan in addition, of course, to uh, if you want to have an MRI, the pre-operative pre CT is this situation with a severe retroversion, you would not really expect on the AP pelvis, and this helps me to plan the operation much more. And I think the average surgeon, I'm an average surgeon, and I need this information preoperatively to know what I'm facing in the, in the, in the surgery. That would be my argument for, having, for going to a pre-operative CT scan. Sorry, but that's why I disagree with Jay, because you don't go by tentative in this. Of course, you can try, you are not successful, you go up. But you have to try to go down if you have a reasonable choice to do this. And you can know it at least in advance, not 100%, but some chances from okay, so better we have, city. Yeah, so we have now discussed the acetabulum. That's a shortening of two centimeters here. Uh, if we do a uh, acetabular reconstruction on this level, do you think it's necessary to do a shortening here of this leg because it will go down maybe about two centimeters? Is there a necess necessity for a shortening procedure? Yes or no? Just answer with yes or no. No? Most of them, no. most of you say no. no. Okay, okay. But it does depend on the soft tissues and, and you didn't e Exactly, the soft tissue information healthy. is probably the basic one uh, we, of course, have to explain, but I come back to that, we have to explain the patients that the soft tissue function is limiting the situation. We were planning in the primary, uh, excuse me, we were, pr we were planning in the secondary uh, uh, acetabulum here, distalizing the femur a little bit. This is data which shows that, of, of course, the force transmission is best when you go into that lower quadrant here. Uh, it's a little bit worse, but still acceptable when you go higher, medial enough, and it's a catastrophe if you go laterally. All the implants which go laterally with the, with the acetabular cup will have uh, problems. This just underlines uh, this discussion. That was what we did uh, during surgery. We used the head as a graft. You see the head was uh, screwed at the posterior rim of the acetabulum. And uh, we rarely use threaded cups. Normally we use press fit cups, but in this tiny lady with this uh, pseudarthrosis with a cup diameter of 40 millimeters, I felt more safer with a threaded cup. The screw is obviously too long here. That's, uh, that's no question, no doubt about it. But uh, the three-year result is okay, and you see she was satisfied with that procedure after an another three years, and they had uh, surgery on the other leg, and she is uh, fine at the moment. And you see the soft tissue function is at least regarding the classical test okay. Any comment? Any other? Klaus, uh, did Mazar? you, did uh, you expose that? I'm sorry. Excuse me. Did you expose the uh, pseudarthrosis? We did surgery? not expose the pseudarthrosis because intraoperatively it seemed to be stable from the pelvic ring. We had enough trouble to expose the ischial nerve and to expose the joint due to the previous surgery. So I was happy not uh, having the necessity to, uh, to expose that. Would you have exposed it and uh, grafted it? No, I, I think that if you were, if you were uh, very convinced that that was stable, yeah, yeah. if you were in doubt, I would have exposed it yeah. and I would have thrown some of that acetabular reaming into that uh, and possibly even uh, put a little plate. Yeah. But if you were confident that that was Absolutely. stable, I would. And she has no, no severe problems on the right side. She has a mild uh, limping and all the things, but no severe problems. Luigi? You, you went directly there for the cup, or you tried to go distally? No, no. I had you, the you CT measurement distally. It was yeah. just 35 it was millimeters. Yeah. 
I had a good feeling about this uh, acetabulum and enough trouble to get a safe fixation in this situation. Well, what I is the size of this third cup? It's a 44. No, it's a. Let's. It's a. Uh, we planned for. Yeah, 44. 44. It's the smallest size we have available. But if we would go below it, we had. Uh, we would have to, to get it. But it was uh, okay with the bone diameter seeing there. Okay, may, we may go I, to. We one, one short comment. Uh, this. This is. Um, a the, the CT scan was completely misleading because uh, this, is, this osteotomy is a combination of Chiari and Salter osteotomy and uh, uh, that's why you had a good shelf there and uh, the, the bone we see in the front which makes the acetabulum appear retrovert is actually heterotopic yeah. ossification. But I can tell you in the surgery it was massively retroverted and I was happy and necessary to get this graft in there. Uh, just we had beautiful presentations today <coughs> who show that after pelvic osteotomies you have can have nice results but the literature says that uh, the patients also, also sometimes have difficulties. Let's go to the next case. Um, this is a 32 year old lady. She has increasing pain since five years. She had never had previous surgery. She has never had previous problems, just the problem started by the age of 25, 26 and increasing pain and now she has severe pain. The first question is when you see an x-ray of such a patient, the question is about the leg length discrepancy. On the left side, you would assume a leg length discrepancy. What's in the audience, your personal uh, assume, assumption is the leg length discrepancy, the shoe lift you need on that side, is this in between two to five centimeters, in between zero to two centimeters, or no shortening of the leg at all? Who thinks it's two to five centimeters of shortening? Who thinks zero to two centimeters? Who thinks the legs are equal, both? Congratulations, I offer you a free coffee in the next break. This lady has absolutely equal legs. You see that here. She just has one centimeter or something like that due to a naturally longer femur on that side. And there's a beautiful literature from the Greek uh, colleagues that in dysplastic patients, you often have a over lengthening of the leg due to childhood treatment on, and whatever. And you must very carefully look on the clinical situation because this patient, he if you do a transfer from the head to the primary acetabulum here, he definitely needs a shortening. If you would do it without shortening, you would lengthen this leg by four or five centimeters. Let's go to the question of cup position. Again, this is a patient you have obviously, and we have, I do not show you the CT, but she has good bone here. She has reasonable bone here. Who would go for a primary cup position? Who would go for a high hip center? Who is primary? Who is for primary? All are for primary. When you go for primary and bring the head down here, and now let's for a moment say this lady has a shortening of five centimeters of this leg. It's not this special situation. She has a five centimeter shorter leg here. So if you would bring it down from here to here, she would have a perfect equal leg length. What is your choice? Would you go for five centimeters in one step here? Would you do, which is called acute lengthening, would you do a preoperative distraction or would you do a shortening osteotomy in these patients? Starting, who, may, maybe we start with Mazar. Sh very short comment, not we, because I have one or two other interesting cases. Mazar? Yes. Well, uh, it, it, we, we have tremendous experience on this and even if the leg um, you have to shorten these, unfortunately, because... Acutely or per distraction? We, t we tried distraction in one case, and uh, it was almost turning into a disaster because of the external fixator pins got infected. Okay, who of uh, the panel members would do a distraction before he undergoes surgery? Who would do acute shortening of this leg? Everyone, great. Any consideration? Other, I mean, in this lady, it's obviously necessary to shorten the leg, otherwise she would have a lengthen. If this lady had a five centimeter shortening here, how much would you shorten during the operation? And how would you proceed? Luigi? If it's shorter, as less as possible. But that's a clinical trial. We start 
we shorten, I will present in my next presentation. Okay. We shorten one centimeter and a half. Then if not enough, we can shorten more with our technique. Okay. But as you presented, the leg length discrepancy here is not too much. It's around one, cent one centimeter and a half yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And we can presume by a prop plan that there is a lengthening around five, six centimeters here. Yeah. So I will assume here a shortening of three, four centimeters. Yeah, we did the shortening of four centimeters. You did the post-operative x-ray and you see the result with the healing of the osteotomy uh, four years post-operatively. The lady is satisfied and has no further problems. But um, there is, of course, always a discussion about the type of implant. You see we took this uh, conical stem here, but there are also diaphyseal fixating stems which are nicely to take this surgery. So we go to the next case. Um, it's a little bit more complex and it highlights issues other than surgical issues. You see that this lady, 27 year old, has some problems. You see the main problem here. It's a body mass index of 41 kilogram. She has 107 kilograms of body weight on a 1.6 meter body length. She has a metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, and she's a heavy smoker. So everything we like uh, in surgery. Who in the audience would refuse to do surgery on this obese patient? Who would refuse it? Who would operate her? What are the others doing? <laughs> I'm asking again, who Send, sending the patient sending, to sending them to Mazar or to Luigi? Okay. Um, who would, what, what, what would be your, it, I've, I've seen her the first time, what would be the advice you give? Jay? Go and lose weight. Go and lose weight. Who else would advise Bariat that? Bariatric and stop smoking. And, stop and smoking. Stop smoking. Stop yeah. smoking, go and lose weight. There is a lot of data out that uh, the combination of obesity, smoking and diabetes, I think the, the odds ratio of getting into an infection is about 12, 12 or something like that. So it raises from 1% to 12% of, uh, of, uh, of post-operative infection. Oh, go lose weight and stop smoking. I did the same and she came back, um, she came back three years later. You see the joint space is a little bit narrowing, a little, just a little bit. She has increased pain, of course. The soft tissue situation is not much different here, but she has lost weight. She got down from 41 kilogram to 35 kilogram body mass index. It's a substantial lose. Um, really, she was now beyond 100 kilograms. She had stopped smoking. Um, just a brief question. Do you advise nicotine? Uh, nicotine supplements when you advise stopping smoking or you just say go home and stop smoking okay is anyone operating patients who are smokers under nicotine supporting uh, substances not very popular obviously okay so she had stopped smoking she was in a better condition she was optimistic who would now do surgery on her in the audience who would do surgery in the audience some more would you do surgery here in the panel on her? Is she symptomatic? She, uh, absolutely. She has a lot of, she, she cannot stand anymore. She has lost her job. She is now uh, unemployed. She complains of pain day and night. Of course, I would not present we, you asymptomatic patients. We can understand that she's really motivated by she's, this She result. has a social problem. Meanwhile, she is motivated. And now she comes and asks you urgently for help. I'll tell her go and lose more weight. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think if, if a patient comes back to you three years later, she was symptomatic 2009 when you met her. She's coming back three years later. She's lost quite a lot of weight. She stopped smoking. So obviously she needs, she needs something done for the pain. Okay, that's right. And we did so. Uh, we uh, uh, answered yes, you get a joint replacement because you, has per you have performed well. And I think we can now go into that procedure. We did it, a stage procedure, 2012 on the right side. You see we had some more difficulties uh, with the bone here. On the left side, it was just a standard. She had, uh, she had again uh, 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 a torsional problem, so we choose this, uh, this uh, conical stem. And you see it went well three years perfectly. She was happy, everything was okay. 
uh, you see still a little bit of weight problems, but uh, it, was, it was perfect. Then she had a car accident uh, on the left side, and you see the volume of her left leg. She has increased her body weight, preoperatively 41 to 35, and then at the moment it raised again to 40 kilograms. She sustained this tibial fracture. It was fixed uh, by our trauma surgeons. Uh, it was the fixation is okay, but she ended up with a superficial wound infection. And of course, you know what happens now. She got a late infection of her leg. We had to remove it, which uh, did not work out very well. Uh, and this is just the situation three weeks ago. She had this revision stem and you can assume she has increased weight again she has again started smoking and i just want to show you this is the literature about the development of body weight after total joint replacement there are four studies uh, 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 focusing on that issue um, in two studies about one third of the patient after joint replacement has decreased the body weight in two studies the uh, certain portion has no change and in all four studies, a significant portion of the patient has increased the body weight uh, after operation. Um, it's an interesting finding, I think, but uh, that is, I think, uh, something special when you counsel the patient and say, go back and lose weight, you must be aware that a significant portion of them is gaining weight again after you have performed a successful operation. We go further to the next case. It's a very short case very just a, a straightforward question this is a 20 year old lady with a monostotic fibrous dysplasia you see it here we have it in uh, once a year in our uh, outpatient clinic for control uh, my residents did not uh, recognize this thing as something dangerous she came back uh, nine months later with a fractured uh, femoral neck here you see this acute fracture with a severe dislocation uh, it's a significant dislocation. We made a CT scan. You see here the monostotic fibrous dysplasia. And my brief question, 22-year-old lady, is just one question to the audience. Would you perform a cemented stem here or a cementless stem? Who would do a cemented stem? Who would do a cementless stem? How about the panel? Any other thoughts about this case? Um, this is an indication for a regular length stem. You can't use a short stem here. <laughs> and Klaus, you're not going to uh, try to reduce and fix this head. Would anyone try to fix uh, this head again? Hubert? How much time Hubert? after the trauma? It's uh, just the same day. She, uh, she was falling down, n not, not even falling down. She was on the stairs and she just felt pain in the leg. She w w was going down and I'm sure this is a pathologic fracture due to the weakening of the, of the femoral neck. Hubert. The question is if the, the head is still alive and your vessels are, I, I think in a 22 year old, you should uh, try to, to fix it. I would do, I would try this. Okay, who in the audience uh, uh, at that time, let's assume we had in uh, 2007, we had no MRI in our department and we could not really tell uh, at the same day, uh, you should, if you, if you would reconstruct it, you would have to reconstruct it within six or eight hours. We had no information about the head. So who of the panel members would do a, a refixation and osteosynthesis? Who would do a total joint? Who is for, for a trial of, uh, of uh, head preserving surgery? I'll tell, Jay, you, I, I'll, Hubert. Tell you, I'll tell you how I would do it though. Okay. It's very different than trauma surgeons. So I would do this through direct anterior, make a little incision, go down to that uh, fibrous dysplasia region, uh, look at the vessels, if the vessels are all intact, reduce it, perhaps graft that area, run then three screws through the side, and I would tell this patient the likelihood is 50-50. Um, and you know, in a 22-year-old, 50 is pretty good. If you can uh, preserve her head and you have 20% okay. chance, I would okay. go. Three screws are not very popular in Europe in the meantime. We went ahead and combined a, a valgization procedure to get the transmission of the force in another direction here, grafted the area, and you see it healed uneventfully. In addition, we, we trimmed the femoral neck through an anterior because she had a problem here, but it uh, really uh, healed and it was a case we, we have to go on.
Mazar, that, just that, a brief comment, please. Uh, that is exactly what I was going to say. Okay. Just to do. Okay. Thanks for your support. And this is just the graph which you should bear in mind. I think we as arthroplasty surgeons not always consider that pseudarthrosis or femoral fractures need a vulgus uh, stimulation and then you can get a healing of the situation. And I think this highlights nicely that we should consider options as well. Now it's the, uh, the final case before I come to a, a, a young lady. This is a really interesting uh, young man, 48 years old. He's not the youngest, uh, but he's 48 years old. He has had a septic coxitis in his childhood 40 years ago. It was healed conservatively, no previous surgery. He has a severe adduction contracture, you see it, and he was walking over 30 years in this position. 30 degrees of adduction, no problems with, with his spine. His spine is pretty flexible. You can, when he sits down, he can bend to right and left, no problem at all. But now the left hip, the left hip is severely damaged, hurting, and he cannot walk anymore. So a flexible spine, a severe adduction, a massively painful left hip. Very brief comment only uh, from the uh, podium here or from the audience. What would be uh, an option to consider? Just very briefly. Any, has anyone an, an idea? Justin? Um, so Resurfacing on the left side. So, so um, uh, there's a good example for um, planning um, a, a use PSI to do a corrective osteotomy of the proximal femur on the right and take down that arthrodesis first because the other hip has no chance, it's almost impossible for the left hip until you've got the right one pointing in the right direction. And with PSI today, with planning a PSI, that's, it's a technical procedure, but it's quite manageable to get that leg out in the right direction first, and then secondary arthro arthroplasty on the left. Any other comment from panel members or Mazar? I I'm sure he's going to refuse uh, the proposals and uh, ask for a total hip on the left hip because it's painful. You mean he will ask primarily for a total hip here and refuses any other things? Uh, I, guess, I guess so. Okay. And actually in the US you could not operate on an asymptomatic hip. So I assume his right hip is asymptomatic. I understand This Justin's is asymptomatic. Argument. The right hip yeah. is asymptomatic. This is asymptomatic. He has right. severe pain here. Yeah. I would do total hip on the left side. And if you would do it, how would you align the cup? Would you do it in in the natural 45 degree position, which and then uh, ends up here with about 10 degrees of inclination, or would you go for a for a uh, uh, adapted cap position in about this direction, which makes an anatomical cap position of uh, let's say 90 degrees uh, inclination? What would I, would, be I always love them horizontal. This would be one case. One case I would consider dual mobility. A dual mobility. Okay. Any other? Opinions from the audience, Mazar? I, th I think I, I would agree with, uh, with uh, J. Pavisi on that. He's, he's obviously a very high risk of dislocation with the pelvic being tilted. Yeah. And, and I think, I think the mobility is a good choice. Any other uh, opinion from the audience? Any other good choice? Uh, dual mobility Luigi? orientation as it is in the natural acetabulum and osteotomy on the other side, definitely. Yeah. If he, he's now 48, if he later gets back pain and you have to do something on this side, uh, um, may we run then into problem with the hip, which will be uh, 30 degrees more uh, vertically than before? And you can see symptomatic on the left side, the Strachmorton sign is uh, pointing that way too. Uh, I did not acoustically get it, please. Uh, Strachmorton sign. <laughs> I see, okay, okay. <laughs> We don't go deeper into that discussion. <laughs> um, I discussed all the options with this gentleman and fortunately enough, he was following the advice which uh, Justin was given. We first started and reoriented this arthrodesis with the, with the ventral plate you see here. It took some time until it heals. It healed, it took about one and a half years, it healed. Then we performed the, the uh, total joint on the other side. He was agreeing that, um, uh, as he know, he would uh, stay in bed for six weeks after this procedure. Then he had another five or six months uh, of healing and then we performed that. Luigi? So you waited the healing of the osteotomy for the We w waited until the healing of the osteotomy because I'm honest. 
I I'm, have not too much experience with yeah. this uh, uh, arthrodesis uh, situations, the approach from anterior. I just wanted to really make sure that this is healed, which was, took about uh, one year, and then we went ahead to the, the other the, side. The, this was a spontaneous arthrodesis, correct? This was a spontaneous, you the, could also the, have considered you consider that, also the total hip on this yeah, side? You could have considered it, but he was uh, used to that, he's a tough man and he did say, well, going into two total joints is a little bit risky for me. Let me have a, a safe standing leg, which is the right one. And it was until today the right choice. This uh, is the situation now uh, about five years or, or seven years after the procedure. He's uh, pretty satisfied and it could have gone worse. This is my final case, just one slide, which highlights the current problems in Germany. And I would really glad uh, be about a opinion from you, a recommendation from you, because I have no solution for this young lady. She's 20 years old. A female refugee comes from Syria, is now since uh, six months in Germany. She has unbelievable pain on both sides, has been previously operated several times. She has no education, no family here, no family back home in Syria, so she is alone. I'm absolutely uncertain about her future social and professional situation. I, I really don't know what to do. You can, of course, handle this surgically. We can do a straight uh, total hip replacement in this young lady, but I'm not sure if she remains in Germany. I, I'm not sure if she goes back to her country, whatever will happen. Um, a brief comment. We have 10 seconds for everyone. A brief comment what, what you would do in this case. Hubert, start, please. I think, finally, I, I would do uh, total hips. Yeah. Mazar, just before you continue, anyone considering in this lady to do an arthrodesis on one side, so she has a lifelong standing leg and do the total joint on the other side? Justin? Jay, Luigi, total joints, Rüdiger? Well, you make a great point, which is adaptation to our environment in her given individual situation. So I would offer a total hip replacement uh, on both sides, but I would give her some time to adapt to the circumstances she is in right now. So we need to buy some time to get really information how she will perform herself in the society when she is alone on herself. She's probably in an institution where she, as a young lady, has difficulties enough. So she should be in a very stable social situation. And then when she is adapted to language, to our culture, then she has probably a better outcome. Mazar, any comment about this? Uh, uh, she, she will refuse a hip arthrodesis because she's probably a Muslim 50% chance. And uh, I would, uh, the, the, my concern here would be bypassing those, uh, the place where the plate and uh, screws used to be. That would be the challenge in surgery. Otherwise, I'd use my standard total hip. I'm not too familiar with Muslim habits. Just explain why she would refuse it for, for the reason for she, body hygiene or, or sexuality, sexuality, or what is the uh, reason? Sexuality would be one. Uh, but mainly she couldn't pray on the floor be, uh, if she had an arthrodesis of the hip. Okay. So, gentlemen, I learned a lot through this session, not only the last thing, but also the cock sign uh, or the cock procedure for, for high, for high riding hip dislocation. I learned about the, tell the sign again, Jay. Throck. Throck. Morton. The Throckmorton sign and a lot of other things. I hope you enjoyed this case discussion. This was great. Thank you very much for all your contributions. Thank you.